All right, good morning. So I'm still trying not to be starstruck. They tell me I need to get out more, but I, I still am in awe of each of these men individually uh, for their individual con contributions. But, but together, I think they, they form a really special uh, left brain and right brain, if you will. Uh, on the one hand, we have Dan Gear, uh, our scientist, our mathematician, our uh, metrics focus, trying to nudge us towards scientific approaches. Um, the way I like to describe Dan Gear to, to newer folks who haven't heard him speak is he has the most intellectual potency per syllable of any human on the planet. <laughs> um, and and if, if he's really our, our left brain uh, and someone I, I try to learn from and many mentor from, um, then we could also pivot to, to, to Richard, our right brain. Uh, many people don't know Richard was... Uh, in the clergy for many years before becoming a, a premier speaker at DEF CON from since DEF CON 6, is that correct? Four. DEF CON 4, uh, every year. Um, and I, I really look at him as the conscience uh, of the industry, the, 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 the source of ethics. Should we be doing this? Why do we do it? What's the pathos and ethos of the hacker culture um, reminding us um, not to uh, lose our footing? I think between the two of them, they, they bring tremendous balance. Uh, to, a, to a pretty difficult field. Um, so um, we'd love to get some clever banter between the two. I think we've seen them each speak. Uh, they're very excellent at written form, uh, prepared remarks, and this uh, ad hoc um, would be very interesting. So I'm going to turn first uh, to Dan Gear. So Dan, any opening remarks on your background, your journey, uh, your contribution to security. How did you even find yourself here after being a, a biology person? Well, I'm not the kind of person who uh, makes a five-year plan for their life. I know that there's uh, folks who believe in doing that. Um, I was never very good at it. Um, when I got out of college, there were no jobs. I took the only one I had, which was uh, actually up the street here um, with the, uh, the Beth Israel Hospital. At the time, I believe I was the only commercial mumps programmer, therefore I was the best in the world. Um, uh, ten years later, I got a, um, I'd been there uh, for quite a while and accumulated a degree in statistics and got a chance to run something called Athena at MIT, um, which I did. And one thing led to another, after which um, I had the pleasure of firing myself. This was, th by the way, if you ever get a chance to do that, by all means do. It's great fun. In front of your staff to fire yourself is just great fun. Um, and did a, um, a consulting firm on Wall Street where we thought what we would be selling was advice on how to do distributed systems management, but it turned out nobody cared what they wanted was security. And that's history. One thing led to another from there. But the transition to being just in the security arena was discovering that nobody cared about distributed system management, which we thought was the cat's pajamas at the time. Mind you, this is a while ago. Um, but people did care about security. So that was a consulting firm on Wall Street in 1991, which is a little early. By the way, for those of you who want to be entrepreneurs, the best way to croak a startup is to be too early. The best way. Ask me how I know. All right, thank you. And how would, how would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, well, Dan's story reminds me uh, of the E.B. White comment that it's no wonder how complicated things get, what with one thing leading to another. And that's pretty much been the way uh, my life has evolved also, uh, which is also a sign of, of how dislocating this entire industry, not just security, but IT, has been for the last couple of decades, last several decades. Uh, in that, uh, like looking at a uh, stick in the water and it uh, parallax view, you, you know, you open one eye, close the other, you you see things bifurcate and go in a different direction. That's that's kind of what's happened to society, and therefore that's what happened to me since I was plugged in to society. In my 20s, I taught English literature at the University of Illinois, and I wrote, wrote fiction. In my 30s and 40s, I was an Anglican, or Episcopal, as they call it here, a clergyman, uh, having gone into the Church of England when I lived in England, I had lived in Spain as a young man and then in England, grew up in Chicago. Uh, and in 1982, I'll try to make it short, I, was, I bought an Apple II for my son, who was 12, and uh, we both learned basic, he learned it a lot better, so he's still making a living at 42. 
uh, in, in computing. And uh, we were playing a game called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, an Infocom game. They were geniuses at Infocom. It was still the best of brand. And uh, I had an insight because I had taught literature and because in the ministry you use text to unfold into community and interact with people through teaching, preaching, counseling, and other modalities out of the world created by that text. And I realized that by interacting with this computer text, I was being changed in fundamental ways. We would call it neoplasticity, the brain we have fancy terms now. My intuition was that I was being rewired by engaging with the symbol manipulating machine that was a computer rather than a book, and therefore that what we were about to experience society-wise was as big as the printing press and writing, and in fact, perhaps what we could call uh, arguably the technology of speech, those four instantiations of the technology of the word with a capital W, that everything was going to change out there too. And I start writing about it in a religious context because I was a clergyman and they told me literally that I uh, was an idiot, that this was never going to happen, no one understood it, this was the 80s. Uh, the article that I wrote first was later published 10 years later as Cutting Edge by a theological journal. Uh, but the technology references in it to uh, moos and mushes and the like were all way obsolete. And in 93, being confronted with taking the jobs that I thought I wanted in that world or uh, acknowledging the cognitive dissonance I experienced trying to articulate what I saw coming uh, to, a, to a domain that was uninterested in it, I left the ministry to speak in right full time about the implications of technological change for society, for culture, for spirituality, for religion, uh, for human beings, how it was going to reshape and retailer the expression of our very identities and selves in a new domain that the technologies were creating. And, and uh, that's, uh, I've just been real, real lucky uh, for a guy with no skills uh, to just speak and write is just a real privilege for the last 20 years. And that's what, I, what I've done. Yeah. I'm going to stick on backgrounds for a moment. Um, we have a, an InfoSec mentors program and a loose affiliation where we try to pair older members of the industry with younger members who are looking to do something different. And one of the most common pieces of feedback I get is, well, I don't have a computer science background or I don't have an electrical engineering. I'm not going to fit in. And I actually point out both of you as giving asymmetric novel contributions to the dialogue because of your varied backgrounds. So Dan, I think one of your most famous um, points is that uh, nature loves diversity and hates monocultures. Monocultures are bad. And, and I sometimes fear that we have um, our, our backgrounds and our demographics aren't, aren't sufficiently diverse. Um, how would you characterize the value that your biology background brings? How has it instructed your worldview and your contributions? Folks, this isn't rehearsed, but I'm grateful that he asked that. Um, the, the, the diversity bit, let me, let me say something slightly different. Um, everybody our age, Richard and my age, came to the field from something else. None of us were trained for it, uh, largely because there wasn't any training to be had. Um, it was all on the job, if you want to call it that. Um, or, put differently, it was all uh, uh, learning which end of... Uh, of the gun to point out and which end to point in uh, was all done under uh, conditions of incoming fire. The, that bit about, though, there being no prior, um, no prior training really available actually produced, I think, this field, more than any other of which I'm aware, is one where almost any preparation that requires you to think has been useful. And in fact, we have a huge diversity of people's backgrounds in this. I mean, yeah, I'm a biostatistician. That means I think in disease models, you know, transmission, immunity, uh, uh, contacts, uh, 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 cost effectiveness of controls, what to do when you don't have enough vaccine, blah, blah, blah. It just comes natural. Um, but other backgrounds are just as good. I mean, uh, civil engineers, why do bridges fall down? Uh, lawyers, um, d the fine distinction between policy and enforcement. Um, you know, doctors, uh, the whole idea of triage from, that comes from the doctor's world is directly applicable to us, you know? And I realize that maybe that's a poorly chosen analogy at the moment, but you've got those that you can fix, those that you can't fix, and the ones in the middle, which if you can fix them, but you have to do it soon. 
I think almost any background that requires you to think. And I've, of course, met people of very diverse backgrounds in this field, and I think it makes it fascinating. It is a renaissance field. It is a renaissance field. Now, mind you, when people like Richard and I get replaced by people who are actually trained for this, um, some of that will go away. So while you can, I think what you ought to do is, to the extent possible, steal the mind view from all the rest of us, look at people with disease models, or look at people with wind shear analysis ideas, or you know anything that is a model for how to think, and steal everything you can, because obviously enough, the fastest technology transfer there is is a person. So steal, steal from us while you can, before we are replaced by people who are the world's leading expert on one cubic inch of the security manual. Uh, same question to you. I mean, uh, you, you certainly stick out like a sore thumb at DEF CON. I think everyone's embraced you. Thank you very you. much. <laughs> In a good way. Um, you know, but most of us tend to focus on what or how. Uh, I've always appreciated your, that you bring the, the why or the soul or the, the human factor to these. Um, so what's your answer? Well, I would begin with exactly the same answer with different background for me as Dan gave. Uh, it is a function of age. It is a function of, uh, as I say, uh, 30 years ago, taking a look at computing where it was going, you, you didn't uh, sign up. <clears throat> and when I first went to DEF CON, DEF CON 4, 96, uh, it was in part because I perceived that, like my son, uh, the young people who we called hackers then, using the word properly before it was you know, <laughs> distorted to mean criminal hackers, uh, we're building, uh, often unknowingly, a, a new world. Uh, and certainly, given the kinds of people who are so good at it, uh, uh, often without any thought for any of the, uh, I don't want to say ethical so much as human implications of what they're doing, how it's going to change people, the options and possibilities it would disclose to people, which is what a hacker is. It's someone looking for a new possibility for action by making complex machinery do something it was not necessarily designed to do. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, at the age of, uh, I think I was 49 when I left the ministry, instead of speaking full time, I could bring something by virtue of, of having immersed myself with the kind of depth that I do with passion and commitment in, in what I had done. And because the background was literature, I mean, my point was that I could see, it was like being at the Terminator on the moon. You know, that's when you see the mountains and the rills and the craters. Uh, if it's all white, you don't see anything. If it's all dark, you don't see anything. But when there's a terminator line, you can see by contrast during the transitional zone what it is that's emerging over against what had been. In other words, it was truly a time of, of, uh, of new paradigm. And I think Dan also pointed to the fact correctly that we are <clears throat> closer to that transitional end because people can get degrees and certifications and, and study the quote field, unquote, and therefore it's, uh, security is becoming institutionalized, and therefore people are not necessarily, uh, well, let me quote Bill Gates, who said, if I were starting today, I would be in biology. I would not be in uh, computing. Or uh, Freeman Dyson, who said the 21st century is going to be the age of bio. Now you splice that with convergent realities from nano and space technologies and material science and, and engineering and new domains are emerging where that kind of uh, insight uh, is going to emerge perhaps even more than in computer security which is being institutionalized. Even across the river at MIT in 2004 uh, a new president was appointed whose background for the first time was not engineering but was biology. <clears throat> and even more telling, I've spoken, I did the first keynotes at, at Black Hat, one, two, uh, been there most years since. And what is now asked of speakers for Black Hat is not what was asked, which was tech, technical expertise of a rare and surpassing sort. Now I was told confidentially, and I'm telling you confidentially, so don't repeat it, please, <laughs> that there is a strong emphasis on encouraging speakers at the new Black Hat, owned by the new Black Hat owners, to de-emphasize programming and computing skills because so many of the people coming to Black Hat do not understand what they are saying. That they are looking for automated processes that can be applied black box style to a complicated system so that boxes for compliance and the like can be checked off. 
and that is also a sign or a marker of the fact that the industry has matured. Now, you also add all the distortion and um, to do that has coming out of the national security state and the fact that this is not just an industry that has grown but a multi-billion dollar industry that has grown become very much part of what we used to call the complex and therefore there is a vested interest in maintaining insecurity at the highest level in order to maintain the security industry at the highest level in the same way we do geopolitically so it's a complicated scene but it's certainly not what it was when I uh, decided to leave the ministry uh, about two decades ago uh, and found such fruitfulness in the exchanges I've had, as, as Dan says, with the diversity of people who, who brought uh, passion, wisdom, and, and knowledge and insight, and middle age often, uh, to a field that uh, welcomed those things. I want to add something there. Um, it occurs to me, I, I do a column on security metrics, um, and the last one we did, I did with a co-author, and the last one we did, um, we looked at the half-life of articles in the computer security literature, and half-life defined as how many times has the article been cited, say it was 100, how long after the article was published was the 50th um, citation. Does that make sense? We're looking at the half-life of articles. And we plotted that um, over a 21-year uh, period, and for what it is worth, the number of authors, the average number of authors on a cybersecurity paper is rising. The average half-life of the papers is, is falling. And we think that that is an unarguable marker for specialization. And I think if you look around the room here, you find people who are specialized in aspects of cybersecurity that are quite arcane. And I, I congratulate all of you. I, don't, I can't recommend to any one of you to try at this point to become a generalist. There's too much to know. I can suggest that you can be a serial specialist, like serial monogamy, I guess, but you can be a serial specialist, but I don't think it's possible to start from scratch and be a broad-spectrum generalist, just like there's no future in, in mathematics trying to be a broad-spectrum generalist about all of mathematics. There's too much of it. It has to be specialized. And I think I, can sh I, think I was able to show that in the literature. So in terms of the rate of change, the rate of change is... I think reflected, albeit with some error, of course, but it's reflected in, in nothing more complicated than the pattern of citation in the academic literature about our field. Um, and you have a, okay, can I add something yeah, to that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I remember reading that, that you wrote, and I remember correlating it with other things that I've written, that that is true generally in the medical field, in science field. The number of citations, uh, the length of time that citations are made for an article uh, falls off dramatically and drastically, in terms, uh, which means in terms of knowledge of the, our own past, even masters of a domain are not intimately familiar with their own history, nor because so much is published in every domain today, are they able to maintain presence at the present. That is, at, in terms of knowing exactly what is being written and articulated in their field. And this raises uh, a, a deeper question. Uh, because people are becoming specialized not only in their specialization, but in a narrower way of thinking, which makes conversation or true dialogue between people in different domains more and more difficult because the points of reference uh, are not there. The common points of reference are not there. And this, because of my other background, uh, when I look at the literature, I look at religion, I, look, I see the same things happening, more and more falling off of the traditional structures of agreement that constitute reality for a large group of people, those are increasingly ebbing into a past in which we nostalgically look back and remember when we all kind of agreed on the same things. And as a token of that, I, I worked with some people at NSA on something once upon a time, and I asked the lead historian there quite seriously, I said, what can you and I discuss historically? Uh, what subjects? which we are sure, uh, of which we are sure, we mean the same things by the words that we use to designate them. And he said, anything up until 1945. <laughs> now, he was not even half joking. He was a third joking and two thirds saying that the degree of classification and the degree of 
uh, the slowness with which things are declassified, even when ordered to be declassified, and the national security state and the kinds of boundaries of secrecy around our very lives that it, in, it enforces means that we are often talking about our own history without realizing that we mean fundamentally different things by the words we use because we designate different knowledge. And if you think that's an extreme thing, a friend of mine at NSA said the other day, I just found out that something uh, I worked on uh, full time in the 80s uh, had a purpose that I did not, nor did any of us working on it know because we thought it was about something else, but that was really a cover for what it really was because we didn't need to know what the real purpose of our project of many years was. And, and he linked that to the fact that uh, a young man had recently come to work at the agency and his parents were very, very anxious because this is where he was going to find out for the first time that both parents worked at the agency. <laughs> so what this does uh, as, as kind of symbol of trust breaking down in a family, trust breaking down in a society, um, is significant, and because of my background, that's the kind of thing I like to pay attention to. I wasn't going to ask this question, but um, given that half-life point you made, Dan, um, I'm recognizing and, and I'm concerned that we do a very, very poor job at capturing our institutional knowledge and our oral tradition. Um, there are, not that Twitter is the best indicator, but we will often see in a case where someone will state something from the Orange Book, for example, and the 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 graybeards will all pound you for being Captain Obvious and pointing out things we already knew, and the new people will retweet it and praise you and read it for the very first time. So I am concerned that we don't have a robust mechanism for capturing and curating the knowledge we should keep could, could and retiring. You please, could you please use the term silverback instead of graybeard? Sure, I think. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. And as we do have this rolling, uh, you know, new people entering the field, et cetera, um, do you have thoughts on how we could better capture, curate, or even settle on nomenclature? I think last night you said the most important page to read in public policy is the definitions page. Actually, I, I hang around Washington these days, folks. For what it's worth, I'm the CISO for Incutel, which you can think of as the CIA's venture capital arm. That's not quite right, but for what it's worth, we have one. And as taxpayers, you should be grateful. It's highly efficient um, use of your money. Um, and so that you know the kinds of places we've invested in, ArcSight, Palantir, FireEye, Veracode, um, Huddle, Okana, um, um, uh, Recorded Future, you get the idea. Uh, these, uh, these are places that we've invested in. Um, it's, it's irrelevant to this topic, um, and it's actually uh, quite on the up and up particularly for those of you who are entrepreneurs, we should talk. Um, but what that teaches us, I think, um, and to Richard's point more than any other, is um, something that I truly believe that all security technology is dual use. It can all be used for offense or defense. It can all be used for, if you will, good or evil, um, to use terms closer to your, to your uh, nomenclature. Um, and so questions of ethic and questions of capability are, I think, increasingly tied together because that which had been impossible did not require rules. That which is possible may well require rules and we are converting impossible to possible at a brisk clip um, and, and quite often in ways that you wouldn't otherwise imagine. Not that it is something today, um, but you know, we can do iris scans now at 50 meters. We can do facial recognition at 500 meters. Um, mind you, that's not commercial off the shelf, go over to Micro Center in Cambridge and buy it technology, but it's, it's available. And that kind of thing raises the question of what does in public mean? I mean, Facebook and Twitter and before that MySpace demonstrated that the definition of public is modified. Um, if there's any, you know, biology. Let me say something about biology. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who was a paleobiologist at, at uh, Harvard and sort of famous, and you may have seen uh, a television show that he ran on PBS for some time. Brilliant guy. Early in his career, he coined a term when he was talking with a, with a, 
he and a colleague published a paper, and the term entered the vocabulary of paleobiologists and others, evolutionary scientists, um, and the term was punctuated equilibrium. The idea was that evolution, evolutionary change is not some you know, steady slope at 8% grade, but instead it's long periods of nothing for, uh, punctuated by rapid change, hence the punctuated equilibrium idea. And I think that that is relevant to our field. I, I think we've had three moments of punctuation, and I think they bear on the field. The first, to my belief, was the appearance of a TCP IP stack in Windows. Uh, was that Windows 3? Uh, in Windows, because what that did was it took an operating system that had been intended for a single owner operator on at most a local network and connected it to the world and thereby made every sociopath your next door neighbor. The, you can actually measure that. If you look at the, pardon my calculus, uh, second derivative of the rate of reports of computer intrusions to the CERT, there was a spike, uh, an impulse function, if you don't mind the math. There was a strong impulse function 120 days after the in introduction of TCP IP as a freebie to the Windows platform. Now, a, s a spike in a second derivative is like lighting the solid fuel on the shuttle. Nothing happens at first, but there's no going back, and pretty soon you know it's lit. And that was the first punctuation, and I think we all owe our jobs to that punctuation, by the way. I think we owe our jobs to that. So you can thank them or however you want to put it. And by the way, I'm not complaining about this, I'm just saying it's a fact. The second one, I believe, was, what would you say, four years ago, maybe as much as five, when there seemed to be this sudden turnover of our opposition from being adventurers and braggarts to being professionals. And I think the, the reason for that was we had made it too difficult to find juicy flaws as a hobby. You now had to work at it as a job. Now, once you have to work at it as a job, what is your reward? And the answer is your reward is not bragging rights. If it's bragging rights, you find something, you announce it to the world, and you are paid in bragging rights. If you're a professional, you find something, you don't announce it to the world because you get paid more money if you don't. And so the, from that moment on, and again, I think I can show this, the rise in zero days traces to that because the percentage of all exploitable flaws that are known in the, some sense of the word public begins to fall once they are largely found by people who don't self-advertise. So the rise in zero days is not a function of our failing on the engineering side, but rather the side effect of this punctuated equilibrium that the people who are finding them don't do it for fun, they do it for money. The third punctuation, which we are in the middle of now, and it is fast, is the eclipse of the general purpose desktop computer as a consumer durable. We're a year past the point at which chips, the major consumer of chips was no longer PCs. PCs sales fell off in this last quarter by a remarkable degree. We are in a fast moment of conversion from a world in which the desktop machine, the, the computer as computer, was the dominant issue to one where it is a computer in your pocket that incidentally makes phone calls. And I, th I think it is along with that, the bring your own device to work, but those could be two simultaneous events instead of two aspects of one event, and only time will tell. So that's how a biologist will tend to think, like, like I'm showing. But I think it's relevant to this question of how did we get to where we are, which might, in Josh, be to, and where will we be tomorrow? Because to a certain degree, Momentum carries, but not in a circumstance of a punctuation. So let's pivot to the future. Um, I, I've been asking a question lately, and I'd love to pose it to both of you. Um, I, I seriously looked at, I think I actually got this from you, Dan. Um, I looked at how our dependence on IT is expanding. It's permeate, you know, security issues used to be our day job, and now they permeate every aspect of our lives. There's a Microsoft operating system in most cars. There's Bluetooth stacks on insulin pumps. And, and everybody in this room is the security administrator for their extended family. Exactly correct. So as, you know, in fact, if you look at the rise of uh, chaotic actors and anonymous and activists, it's in response to perceived uh, surveillance and censorship and whatnot. And it's finally on CNN. 
You know, my mother-in-law hears about hack attacks, which makes me want to break things to hear the term hack attack, but it's like a Big Mac attack. Um, but now that it is permeating more aspects of our, our life, our dependency is rising. Um, but I feel our dependency is rising faster than our That's the right question. Okay. Let, me, let me tell you why. Let me pick up on some of the things that Dan has. Start to formulate some rules that will give people a clue as to how to behave in light of this new fact, uh, one of which is the uh, end of the Fourth Amendment, uh, as Dan, uh, to which he alluded by different words. The uh, unjustifiable search and seizure um, is meaningless when the head of uh, Homeland Security can say, everything we do is justifiable. And when asked, uh, do you have any ethical concerns or legal concerns about the use of warrantless wiretaps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the answer, and I quote him, was, no, I don't, because we have the power. And to ignore the large-scale reconstruction of identity and the implications for safety and security and, and, and it, uh, it, it is just wrong as you go about your daily work as if it doesn't have powerful implications for that. You, you are creating uh, structures and boundaries within which people are trying to learn how to live, but they don't know what they are. And in the intelligence community with which I've just hobnobbed a little, uh, the global intelligence networks have been redefined by what technology has done, legal and ethical follow. Uh, we literally are not who we thought we were, and that is going to be happening more and more. Uh, which is one of the sources of anxiety, uh, true anxiety, victimization, uh, rage, and helplessness on the part of so many of the people in the audiences to which I speak because they don't know who they are or what to do in the face of what they experience in a nebulous sort of way as an overwhelming uh, sense of threat in the environment. So this is... I'd, I'd like to hear what Dan... I know we've talked about this probably a little bit, but how do you come at all that? Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, the definition of public, um, I don't know if anybody here subscribes to uh, Lauren Weinstein's uh, privacy list, but he's continually rattling there about, just remember, public is public. And there's days when I think, you're so right. And there's days when I think, would you just shut up? And, um, <laughs> Um, because it, it comes down to, all right, again, I'm, I'm being an old guy, which is, comes more easily uh, these days, but, um, <laughs> but um, I grew up when you could still see the 19th century um, in the Deep South. And um, even today, um, I don't lock my doors or leave, and I leave my car keys in the car and so forth. Um, and it's such a contrast with what I do online, because online I'm exactly the opposite. The web that I can see, the, the World Wide Web that I can see is shrinking because I refuse JavaScript, and it's shrinking. Um, I have a 401k, it's with Fidelity, Fidelity's right up the street here. Um, do you know that they will not take instructions on paper anymore? You cannot write them a letter. You can send them email, but you cannot write them a letter. They simply don't accept it. I sent them a paper letter, as you might imagine, stubborn SOB that I am, <laughs> and uh, what I got back was email, and I had never given them an email address, which means, of course, they bought it somewhere. ADP, same thing. You tell them, I'm not gonna use the iPay service, which is how you get a W-2 online. I'm not gonna use it. Would you be so kind as to remove the default password that you give to everybody from my account because I'm never gonna use it? And by the way, if somebody tries to use it, it isn't me. Will you acknowledge that? No. Um, you know, that kind of thing, back to the dependence thing. Mm. Um, or, to that matter, what's me? Um, you know, if I am my data, then I am fast losing control of it unless I'm prepared to live a pre-industrial life. If I am who I say I am, you and I and everybody else will have to make peace with the national strategy for the for trusted identities in cyberspace, uh, which basically, no offense to Richard, I think is a bigger deal than what the intelligence community has to say. Uh, Ed Appel, who is a friend of mine and was um, for many years a special agent in charge in San Francisco, and his beat was, 
uh, industrial espionage back when that meant something different than it does now. But same idea in the end. Um, he said, be careful what you ask for, that your choice is not big brother or not. Your choice is one big brother or lots of little brothers. Be careful how you pick. And so when you look at, for example, the National Strategy for uh, Trust Identities, it has a lot going for it in terms of making some sanity out of this and reducing the amount of fraud and on and on and on wonderful things. On the other hand, it makes all of the credit reporting agencies, all of the big banks, Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon, makes them all credentialers. So now what you have is you may have a state of Massachusetts or whatever driver's license, but you're also going to get one uh, from Google or from Amazon or from whatever. Do you want that? Do you want 25 of them? Do you want one? Um, the arguments for having one, you all understand, you know, because people who wear USB necklaces or have, you know, post-it notes full of passwords in their pocket or whatever, that's a problem. On the other hand, if it's all in one place, in my view, that's also a problem. It's, it's hardening, and this is something that maybe Richard can speak to, too. It's it's reacting to a need to harden, but by hardening in the sense of embrittlement, rather hardening in the sense of toughening. Well, that's, that's very good. And I, I've heard you uh, say that quote about, do you want one big brother or, one, or many little brothers? And I mentioned it to somebody not too long ago, and they said, well, we have both. Uh, we, we now yes, have... That was an optimistic <laughs> question, yes. <laughs> uh, Ten years down the line, after that remark was made, as if we had a, a choice, we we do have we do have both. Um, and I just want to say, um, also, as I listen, Dan, and I mean, I want to say up front, I, I was going over one of my recent speeches that had 30 pages of notes in it, and uh, I noticed that the person quoted about every third page was Dan. Um, so I, I agree with your your statement. I mean, uh, you, you can't. You can't go wrong sharpening your sword against against uh, uh, his intellect. As I listen to him, I also think, not being able to help, a little deconstruction, that what you're hearing is emblematic of exactly the impossibility of our situation. He says, unless I want to live retro, unless I want to live off the grid. In other words, in my terms, unless I want to protect an identity which has been internalized as a result of interacting with prior technologies, a very self, which literally did not exist before it came into being by agreement socially and culturally. Um, how, how can I live in this brave new world and go forward? Let me give you a, another example of that. Uh, I was asked in the, back in the 80s, 90s, talk to school districts in my area of Wisconsin uh, about what was coming in technology. And one of the dilemmas I ran, ran up against was that the curriculum was defined by a top-down hierarchical structure and teachers who needed that structure in order to function comfortably and health, hence self-selected into that structure were advised on a kind of spreadsheet-like grid by day, by topic, by lesson to administer that hierarchical structure through the year. And they were comfortable with that. Uh, but suddenly you had people getting information around that structure. And when I spoke for one of these school districts early on in Illinois, I said, what are the real problems you face? He said, well, we're given good grades by the companies that hire our graduates, Motorola, Abbott Labs, uh, Baxter Labs, Northern Illinois, uh, except in uh, group work, group learning, uh, group uh, learning to work as teams. We don't, we don't train them very well in doing that. And I pointed out that that structure they had adopted prevented people from working in, in teams. Now what was really happening was that they were having to learn a whole new way of being, which was an identity becoming subsumed in a corporate structure, in a cooperative structure, uh, kind of like a cell discovering it was part of a body and not just a cell with a boundary uh, around it. And the example I gave was, when I said, what do you mean by group learning? And they described it, uh, the sharing and so on and so forth, that we all take for granted today in a networked and social media world. I said, you know what we called that in my day? We called that cheating. Now, I was a pioneer in group learning in my day. <laughs> and it usually got me sent to room 127 uh, because Bruce Rockwell in my physics class was the donor and I was the donee. Uh, but this is just a true 
uh, not exaggerated statement. I was told to work on my own, to not share information, to cover your paper, exactly the opposite of the turning upside down that has happened to learning and work as a result of technologies which turn people into nodes in a network instead of standalone monadical, monadical, not maniacal, but monads. Um, and what you're hearing, I think, in part from Dan is the struggle which we all experience to some degree to be who we are, to be, to be a me, as he says, to be a self. Because the fundamental linchpin of uh, Judeo-Christian, Islam, or whatever you want to call it, ethical systems for the last couple thousand years has been the notion of a responsible self. And as we look forward to where hacking is moving, I'm talking more and more about biohacking now, and what is going to come and what it's going to mean for identity when the increasing proliferation, cheapness, and ubiquity of tools for biohacking in all of its forms are as widely available as they're becoming, which is kind of where computer hacking was in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, we're going to have this on steroids because people will be able to fundamentally design their children in a, to a different degree. Uh, it's not science fiction. They're true ethical quandaries. And uh, people raise the fact of them existing, but I don't hear any serious thinking going on about what it really means to be for the public good, for the corporate good, to do good, to be a mensch in this world. What do those terms mean? And what does it mean for you when you show up at work, having been assimilated by the various Borgs for which you work? Uh, and how do you put a boundary around your own integrity and identity in relationship to the corporate identity and the behaviors it requires you to perform? We have a, about five minutes left. I know we have oh. some prepared closings, but... Um, Let me add something to what he just said, though. Yeah. Um, Larry Castro, who uh, spent 45 years at the NSA and rose to deputy director, um, is now at the Chertoff Group, uh, a, useful, a, a general revolving door, if that means anything to you. Um, but he was asked what he wor would worry about if he was still on the job, and his answer was indicative um, of exactly what you just said. He said, if today I would worry about the, uh, the maker culture, particularly the drone guys. Tomorrow I would worry about the do-it-yourself bio. bio yeah. And um, again, that's someone who spent 45 years staring into the uh, abyss, as you would say. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if there's actually maybe the most important thing as, a, as an industry we could do, Josh, is that we could say what we learn not to do and tell the people who are following us who are worrying about bio right. how to learn from us. Right. We can be the canary in the coal mine. And tell them to respect their elders. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, there's a comical, hopefully comical, palate cleanser here. Um, but as you know, Jericho and I researched Anonymous for two years, and I have some breaking news for the journalists in the room. After a lot of open source public combing, we found their leader. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, um, one of the, the big takeaways from that research is this is the, uh, the Vanity Fair piece on chaos and control and the battle for the internet when the UN takeover. We don't really have time to get into it, but one of the things that the writer said was after he went to Washington to talk to all the grown-ups, um, he, he called about a month later, he said, Josh, there are no grown-ups. They don't get it. And a, a large concern I've had is as this permeates our lives, our rights, our safety, um, and I look to the elders that we've had, the, the problems have grown larger, as fantastic as they've been in paving the way. And one of the things that I've been wondering is, who, who is the next guard? And, and, and how do we activate the next guard? You know, you have Kaminsky testifying to Congress, that's a good sign. You have our, you know, ultimate... Uh, boundary spanner and Gene Kim, you have H.G. Moore's Thunder God status and whatnot. Uh, there's even that evil squirrel. Um, <laughs> but my question to you guys is, um, I, I think many of us have depended upon you. We recently lost uh, Gene Schultz. I worry for the health of some of our other pillars. Um, is it time maybe to not pass the torch, but to amplify and spread the fire to this room? Is it time for us to take leadership positions? 
how can you inspire us while we have you both on stage? The short answer is sure. Uh, do it. Uh, just do it because nobody can stop you from doing it. One of the great benefits of the uh, digital revolution is that it gives power to those who are nodes in the network and know how to use it. And you can use power by contributing and participating. Power is not dominating and controlling. It's putting out there what you have got with intention, passion, and clarity. And if it's true, people will recognize that it's true in the same way that a river kayaker I know says, when you look at the rocks, you hit the rocks. And when you look at where the water goes, you go where the water goes. Mm -hmm. Well, leadership is articulating truly, clearly, and simply where the water goes. And everybody says, oh, that's water and that's where it goes, and they go where the water goes. So just do it, because nobody can stop you. And if you're doing it, um, people will gather around you and, and collaborate. But it is a different world in which collaboration is, is quick. Uh, mental time is, is uh, requires shelf space more than cereal, even at the grocery store. It's, um, it's a very competitive world for that. And the other thing is, as bio in, increases opportunity, of longevity, I mean, you, we're, we may have one foot in the grade, but then we have three or four feet coming that we're going to add on through spliced bio <laughs> applications. And the, we're not done yet. What comes after correct? Silverback? I mean, we, after Silverback, <laughs> there used to be a book called The Seasons of a Man's Life, written in the 60s about developmental stages of males, and it ended at 65, which it was called, <laughs> it was called senescence. Which, which means beyond here be monsters and darkness in the deep. <laughs> uh, and and uh, we want to say, you better rewrite that book. Six, largest group of people by percentage growth currently in America is 100 and over. 80 to 100 is second largest percentage growth. Um, people keep telling me, oh, you're 69. Well, you'll live to whatever. Well, they, they don't know either, but uh, you plan to have a career that goes well. You plan to have a life. That's a way of saying we're not getting out of the way. So I, Nor do we want you to. <laughs> I, I, ideally, we want to be able to find ways for us, too, to participate in these collaboratory structures that we build together. But one of the reasons it worked for me at DEF CON is because the kids who now work at DARPA and CIA and NSA and all those places got how much I respected them. And if there is an exchange, regardless of age, that is mutually respectful by virtue of what we bring to the table, which is the great thing about the hacker meritocracy, it's what do you contribute? And if you work your way up the ladder, then you're invited in. Uh, the old days, hacker meritocracy really rewarded those who did their homework and then asked questions and didn't just say, teach me how to whatever. Uh, if you bring that mutual respect, uh, then the collaboratories will continue to be built regardless of age. And, End of story. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, the duty of a teacher is to be surpassed by his or her students. Um, I think Richard and I would both easily agree that that's your job. Um, we've sort of carried the, I don't plan to leave the planet anytime soon, but on the other hand, um, the worst thing that could happen to you is for all of us to discover immortality. That would just be a disaster in every direction. Uh, my wife is a behavioral neuroscientist, and she, if she were on stage here, she would say, and remember, if you live long enough, you'll be demented. Um, so, um, you know, bear that in mind. Um, now, I, I asked a favor of Dan that uh, I'm hoping we can do now, which is uh, maybe to give us some inspiration. I was hoping Dan could close with uh, if. All right. Well, um, this was a set. This is the one part that this is a setup. And Josh, um, his his point, if I can make it for him, is that um, complaining or running circles around those in power only lasts so long before it becomes tiresome. And that, in fact, at some point, you have to say, um, either I'm going to acquiesce or I'm going to lead. And yeah, you've all seen little cartoons and things about people saying give me the wheel and someone pulls the steering wheel off and just hands it to them. No, that's not quite what we meant. Uh, what it meant was if you are serious about this and as far as I can tell this is a room full of serious people you got to be prepared to take positions and by that which I mean positions in the employment sense you've got to take positions that where um, success is far from assured and there will be an audience 
that is not um, your friends. Um, that's hard to do. And so what Josh wanted me to do was to um, share with you what I think is one of the great uh, poems of the English language, it's If by Rudyard Kipling, which I can almost recite, but lest I fail, I do have a crib sheet. I say I can almost recite because when I was 14, uh, my dad paid me $5 to memorize it. Um, that was a while ago, but the $5 bought what he wanted. Um, my mama, God bless her, had me memorize the 128th Psalm, if you want me to do that one as well. Um, competing $5. Um, so it goes like this. If you can keep your head when those about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet, don't look too good or talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph or disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the words you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or see the things you give your life to, broken and stoop, and build them up again with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on a single turn of pitch and toss and lose and begin again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can make your heart and nerve and sinew to serve their turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither friends nor loving, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. And uh, Richard's going to close with uh, one of the best islands from the Clickstream. Yeah, J Josh just bought the very last printed copy of the book, uh, although I think you can get used copies for a penny at Amazon. Uh, but this was my favorite one. It's called uh, Ferg's Law. And uh, it is simply a footnote to what uh, Dan said. It's wonderful what five bucks used to buy, isn't it? Um, I'll just read the last paragraph. It's a conclusion of Ferg's Law. Ferg was a guy in Kentucky who wrote to me when he read my columns online. And uh, he said, my law is uh, when everything can go right, it will. And at the best possible moment. It's an antidote to Murphy's Law. I was talking about the negativity in response to what was happening in the world. And it certainly applies here in Boston this week. Negativity is a way to build da a dark, familiar reef under our swimming selves. The ultimate source of negativity is a lack of courage and a need to make the darkness safe rather than risk the open water. At the graveside, and we are always at the graveside, the powerful compression of grief tunes our awareness to what matters most. We surrender to the truth that is always there but buried, our deep longing for forgiveness and mutual forbearance, our desire to surrender the need to be rigid or right. The readiness is everything. And during those moments of exquisite timing, told by a clock that ticks to a different rhythm, we know that when everything can go right, it will, at the best possible moment. We weep and we embrace one another. The universe is gregarious and welcoming. We are built to live in space that is gateless, unbounded, and free. Thank you, Josh.